9.15 on Saturday morning. So you just have to bring your own map, and it's for all levels. And okay, so that's enough about me and the library. Please join me in welcoming back speaker, author, and journalist, Evan Wiener. Thank you. I think you have to shut the light here. Yeah. See that guy in the middle? How many of you know who he is? Yeah, I worked with John for 15 years. Wow. 15 years. And uh, I wish I could tell you some stories, but they're x-rated, so <laughs> anyway. Uh, but I do have one story. We're going to kick off the football talk with one story, and this is me. Uh, I work with him on the radio show that's Dennis Steele, who was the producer, and uh, he called me by my last name. He called Dennis by his first name. He said, what's, what's with me? I mean, I said, he likes you. He said, no, he calls everybody by their last name. If he doesn't like you, uh, I said, no, he likes you. Believe me, he likes you. Uh, but uh, I was on the Madden Cruiser as well. Uh -huh. um, you know, with Willie, the, the driver and all, but we, we spent 15 years together in that Sync Sound in Manhattan where he did his syndicated, two of his syndicated radio shows, uh, the John Madden Sports Quiz and the John Ma Madden Sports Calendar. And uh, we were together, I was with him more than Kenny Stabler. In fact, he only coached the Raiders for nine years. I was with him for 15. 15, so there he is. Uh, oh, that's the Drake Hotel in Chicago. And I could give you this man the story because it's clean. And Michael Frank was his assistant. Michael did the bus tour, uh, tours and the trips and all that other stuff. So they're driving into Chicago and they leave the bus there and they go to the Drake Hotel. And they check in and there's this uh, rather wiry, short guy with long hair with an English accent who's in the uh, elevator with John, as Michael Frank pointed out. And he says, uh, to, he says Mr. Madden, Mr. Madden, uh, I, I, I need to shake your hand. I need to shake your hand. Um, you've taught me, I'm an English guy, and you've taught me all this about football. I think that I can really watch football and understand it. Thanks to you. Thanks to you. And, and uh, I, really, I really have to thank you. And he gets off. So Madden's with Michael Frank. He looks at Michael Frank and said, you have any idea who that guy was? He said, yeah, he was Mick Jagger. <laughs> who? Mick Jagger. Who? Mick Jagger. You know, I can't get no satisfaction. He looks like he can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> John, I wrote a book, which is now an e-book, and uh, John said, you know, you need to write a book about the history of football because you got all these interviews and all that. So uh, I said, I don't have a cover. So I'm looking and looking, I'm thinking in the back of my mind, well, what kind of cover, being that I worked with John for 15 years, Madden, nobody called him John. Uh, I worked with him for 15 years, well, what kind of cover? And I'm going through this file of pictures that uh, a guy by the name of Norman McLean got a settlement when UPI couldn't pay him anymore, so they gave him his pictures. So I said, this is it. This is it. This is the Brooklyn Dodger uh, running back, uh, Benny Feathers. And there's a little unnecessary roughness here, right? And look at the elements. Look at the elements. Yeah, it's got to have elements. You have a good football. Well, not anymore because it's all artificial turf. But uh, you've got to have elements. It's Pittsburgh, Smoke City, Steel City, and it's dirty and it's grimy. And this guy's being brought down with you know, unnecessary roughness, and then you got the referee. Looks like he's ready to go on the golf, golfing, doesn't he? Yeah. Um, you know, all he needs is a caddy and four, yeah. but this is football in the elements. And football was supposed to be an element sport. They I mean, play the Super Bowl on the rug now. I mean, they play, there's no dirt. I mean, you know, John used to talk about, uh, you gotta have some dirt on your uniform. You gotta have grass stains. You gotta have some blood. And by the way, are punters football players or kickers in general? Yes or no? No. They just happen to be there. No, they're really not real. The real, real football players come in here and you guys do whatever you do. Anyway, so that was uh, football in the 1930s. It's the Brooklyn Dodgers against the Pittsburgh Pirates owned by Art Rooney. It uh, was a coal miners game. It went from a mom and pop store to a multi-billion dollar business. The roots are in West Pennsylvania, the coal mines. 
But the first game happened to be pretty close to here. It was Princeton against Rutgers, and the game did not resemble anything that you see on you know, Thursday night. I'm going against the football game, right? Uh, to, so on Thursday night, uh, Friday night lights, high school, Saturday college games, Sunday the NFL, Monday the NFL. You have a whole bunch of guys out there. It's more like a rugby game, and it was not very easy to score. Rutgers and Princeton played the first intercollegiate football game on November 6, 1896, in New Brunswick, and Rutgers won the game 6-4. I wonder what the over and under was. You know, and I wonder who, you know, who was favored. Uh, the game was played with two teams of 25 men under rugby-like rules. The teams lined up with two members of uh, each team more or less stationary near the opponent's goal with the hopes of being able to slip over and score from unguarded positions. The remaining 23 players were divided into groups of 11 and 12. 11 fielders lined up in their own territory as defenders. The 12 Bulldogs carried the battle. Now, the first rules for football were written up in New Haven by Walter Kemp, who was the coach of the Yale football team in every February up in New Haven. There's a uh, college all-star gathering, a uh, dinner, uh, where the top college players are, get the Walter Camp uh, on their team and the Walter Camp Award. Uh, Walter Camp became known as the father of American football, and he first becomes involved with the game. Uh, this guy is Pudge Heffelfinger. How many of you like free agents in any sport? Free agency, where a guy goes from team to team to team to team. And you're seeing it in college now, too, in college football, where a guy goes from team to team. This guy may have invented that. Uh, 1892, paid players in Pittsburgh, the Allegheny Athletic Association, or AAA, and the Pittsburgh Athletic Club, the PAC, uh, well, they led to the making of the first professional football player. A former Yale All-American guard by the name of William Puch, Pudge Helfinger was paid $500 by the AAA to play in a game against Pat, uh, becoming the first person to play football. John Brelia, uh, another guy, uh, he's 16 years old, great player. Uh, but he's the first guy to jump. He's 16 years old, he's a quarterback, and uh, he accepts uh, 10 bucks uh, and plays for Latrobe. Uh, he wasn't supposed to play for Latrobe, but he ended up playing for Latrobe against the Jeanette Athletic Club. Uh, the Allegheny Athletic Association fielded the uh, first completely professional team for its two-game season in 1896. By the way, the Yale guards signed with the other team and then jumped the next day to the other team. Uh, this is the Latrobe football team, and this is the guy that cracks me up here, the guy with the derby. <laughs> you know, hey, these are rough, tough football players, right? And yet he's got a derby over there. Uh, the Latrobe Athletic Association football team became the first team to play a full season with only professionals in 1897. Well, Philadelphia had the first team. Uh, it was not uh, in Philadelphia. It was the Frankfurt Athletic Association. And that was uh, organized in May of 1899. Now, this is like the forerunner of the Green Bay Packers. Anybody here own stock in the Green Bay Packers? It's, it's, it's worthless. You got a piece of paper to put on your wall. You don't get any dividends on it. Yeah, that's all you do. But Frankfurt kind of pioneered this uh, in Philadelphia in 1899. The cost of purchasing a share in the association was 10 bucks. That's a lot of money uh, back in those days. Uh, multiply it by about, uh, I don't know, 35, 40 now, she got 400 bucks. Uh, however, there were also contributing memberships ranging from a buck to 250 that were made available to the general public. In keeping with its charter, which stated that all profits shall be donated to charity, all of the team's excess income was donated to local charitable institutions. The original Frankfurt Athletic Association disbanded prior to the 1909 season. Uh, the very early days of professional football was basically, we'll set up here, we'll play a game, 
And if we're here next week, we might be in the league or we might not be in the league. The oldest team in the NFL is the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, they started out in Chicago as the Morgan Athletic Club, and uh, the big M for Mormon, and they had the Cardinal colors, red. Uh, it was a neighborhood team, uh, and was formed on the south side of Chicago. The team later became known as the Normals, then the Racine Cardinals, named after a street in Chicago, and then the Chicago Cardinals. The team would relocate to St. Louis in 1960, becoming the St. Louis Cardinals. 1988, owner Bill Bidwell moved the team to Tempe, Arizona, named it the Phoenix Cardinals. Uh, and then in 1994, he renamed the team the Arizona Cardinals. The team now plays in Glendale, Arizona. It is the oldest professional operation, or the oldest continuing operation in professional football. And uh, that's the Chicago League, and that uh, logo may look familiar, doesn't it? Yeah. But it wasn't the Chicago Bears. Uh, but that is the Cardinals, Champions, <laughs> Illinois, 1902. Uh, baseball, baseball, Major League Baseball. The guys who played baseball during the summer decide, well, let's make a couple extra bucks if we can't go into vaudeville in the uh, fall and winter. Baseball's Philadelphia Athletics, Connie Mack's team, and the Philadelphia Phillies formed the first professional football teams, joining the Pittsburgh Stars in the first attempt uh, at a league named the National Football League in 1902. It has nothing to do with today's NFL. Chicago Football League, well, that was several clubs, such as the Chicago Tigers uh, in the uh, Chicago land area, also Hammond, Indiana, Rockford, Decatur, Racine, Illinois, and Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Ohio and New York had leagues. By 1904, Ohio had at least seven professional teams. Maslin winning the professional title, the Ohio Independent Championship. Maslin is still a powerhouse, but that's in high school football now. Well, Theodore Roosevelt, he might have saved football as an industry. He might not have. You know, the prevailing thinking is that he did, but if you just take a closer look at it, he kind of helped with some different rules of football. You know, Teddy Roosevelt, the bully pulpit. Uh, he threatened to ban football in America unless rules were implemented to make the game safer after reported 40 players died from injuries suffered on the field uh, in the 1904 and 1905 seasons. No one could actually figure out how Roosevelt could really end the game. What was he going to do? Take a flashlight and go to western Pennsylvania and tell the coal miners, stop playing in the dark? There's no way he could do that. Uh, but uh, he felt a threat of a ban was enough to get changes in playing rules to make the game safer. Out of the Roosevelt Initiative uh, would come the NCAA. Theodore Roosevelt bought the uh, presidents of, uh, brought the presidents of Harvard, well, in college football, you could have bought them too uh, back in the day. Anybody see, uh, what was the movie, Horse Feathers uh, with the Marx Brothers when they tried to buy the best football players? You know, that movie still holds up. It is, what, 90 years old? It still holds up. Anyway, so he, he didn't buy them. He brought the presidents of Harvard, Yale, and Princeton into the Oval Office and said, fix the game or else. But it wasn't just that. Roosevelt had an absolute hatred of the Harvard president, Charles Eliot. It was like Groucho Marx singing uh, in, in uh, Horse Feathers. Uh, whatever it is, I'm against it. That was it. Uh, the Harvard contingent wanted to change football. Uh, Walter Camp and the Yale people said, let's keep it as is, and the Princeton people are just kind of there. Uh, now, take a look. I don't know if you can see this all that well, but uh, it says down here, the 12th player in every football game. On the shawl, it says death, and it's, uh, you know, guys, bones, and a watermelon-sized football. That was the football in those days. It was watermelon-sized. And a trail of dead bodies on the football field. There were a lot of people who were saying, we got to get rid of this game back then. 
Um, of course, nobody could figure out how to stop the game, but the game was dangerous. In fact, Roosevelt's kid was injured in uh, the, one of the games he played. Uh, Roosevelt, I demand that football changes its rules or be abolished. Change the game or forsake it. Theodore Roosevelt Jr. suffered major injuries in high school and in college. Well, this is what might have saved football. That's Teddy Roosevelt, and that's the Rough Riders. Now you're going to ask me, what do the Rough Riders, the guy who went up, the guys who went up San Juan Hill with Roosevelt in what was the Spanish-American War, which really wasn't much of a war? Uh, anyway, so what are the Rough Riders and Roosevelt's background in the 1898 war? have to do with football. Everything. Yeah, Roosevelt had a soft spot for the game. Ten of the Rough Riders, the soldiers who fought with him in Cuba, gave their occupations as football players when they enlisted in 1898. And here's a rugged outdoorsman too, right? So, uh, but uh, ten of those guys. And that's what made Roosevelt think, I'm not going to get rid of this game. I have loyalty to these guys. As a result, the American Football Rules Committee was formed in 1906, plays designed to open up the game uh, and make it uh, less dangerous to play were introduced. For instance, uh, it, it was first and five. It wasn't first and ten, first and five. But the quarterback cannot, or anybody, cannot throw a forward pass. You've got to go behind you. So sometimes they pick up a player and throw the player to get a first down. Huh. Sometimes you land on your head the wrong way. These were things that were going on in football at the time. The committee passed legislation that led to the introduction of the forward pass. They changed the distance to be gained for a first down for five to ten yards. More importantly, all mass formations in gang tackling were banned. Uh, not necessarily in the NFL on the old days of the Suicide Squad. Uh, Jim Thorpe, Cat and Bulldogs. He looked a lot older than he was. Uh, I knew a guy by the name of Al Wester, who was uh, with Mutual Radio. And this is probably in the 1940s, and Jim Thorpe didn't have any work, didn't have any job. Al decided he was broadcasting games to go find Jim Thorpe. He found him passed out in a bath, uh, bathtub, Al said, sobered him up, and he got him a job doing uh, color commentary on Mutual Radio in the 1940s. Jim Thorpe. In 1915, Jack Cusack signs Jim Thorpe and names his team the Canton Bulldogs. 1916, with Thorpe and former Kyle High School teammate Pete uh, Kalak starring, Canton win 9 0 1. They won the Ohio League Championship and they were proclaimed, they may have just called themselves, the pro football champion. That's Curly Lambeau. Curly Lambeau stumbled into something uh, that is prevalent today in all of sports. He got corporate money and sold the team's naming rights, Green Bay team, to the Indian Packing Company, a meat company. They became the Green Bay Packers. Now, Lambeau didn't go to Wharton or the Stanford or the Harvard or the Yale uh, or Yale. He never got an MBA. He was just looking for money, except he invented something, naming rights, selling the naming rights. Uh, it's 1919 that Earl Curly Lambo and George Calhoun organized the Green Bay Packers, whose namesake was Lambo's employer, the Indian Packing Company. And they gave the team 500 bucks for equipment and told the team you could practice on our company fields. And uh, so Lambeau stumbles on this, and uh, he comes up with something that would not be touched for many, many years, decades, decades later, by Jerry Buss uh, over with the Los Angeles Lakers when he sold the naming rights uh, to his arena, to uh, a bank back in those days, which is out of business today. NFL's coming, but not yet. Uh, the world champions, the Akron pros, the Akron professionals, and you might notice this guy here. That is Fritz Pollard. Now, football was integrated long before baseball was integrated. Football was integrated. 
Uh, Fritz Pollard was the co-coach, co-captain of the uh, Akron Professionals. Uh, around this time, all these people in all these leagues are saying, hey, listen, there are too many leagues around. We don't have any real rules about contracts, about how much money we're paying. We got to do something, and we got to uh, dra stop drastically rising salaries of five dollars a game to seven dollars a game back in those days. Uh, and this also was right after World War One, and it's also in the middle of the Spanish flu epidemic, which lasted three years. Um, it, was, it was most prevalent 1918, 1919, 1920. Uh, players jumped from one team to another. They wanted the most money. And there was the use of college players who were still enrolled in school. Well, in 1920, the uh, Akron Pros and the Canton Bulldogs and the Cleveland Indians and the Dayton Triangles sent representatives to a meeting in Canton, Ohio. And that resulted in the formation of the American Professional Football Conference. A second meeting followed with teams from Ohio and Indiana and New York and Illinois in attendance. And they changed the name to the American Professional Football Association. You watch them now every Sunday and Monday and soon Saturdays and Black Friday, the Jets and the Dolphins. And Thursday, it's known as the National Football League today. The NFL, 1920, Decatur Staley team. And uh, this guy in the middle, uh, George Hallis, was the right fielder for the New York Yankees before Babe Ruth. <sighs> Babe was, I don't know, you think Babe Ruth was a better baseball player than George Hallis? <laughs> anyway, yeah, the last Yankee right fielder before the Babe was George Hallis. Uh, also, George Hallis did something similar to Curly Lambeau. Uh, he had no idea what he was doing, but he did it. Uh, the Chicago Bears start 1921. A.E. Staley uh, turned the Decatur Staley's over to the player coach George Hallis, who moved the team to Cubs Park in Chicago. It wasn't Wrigley Field yet. Staley uh, paid Hallis $5,000 to keep the name Staley's he did a lot of things, including cars, for one more year. Hallis made the uh, halfback, Ed Dutch Sturdivant, his partner. So Lambo and Hallis are the guys who invented selling naming rights. They're the ones. Uh, here is Fritz Pollard. Fritz Pollard was systematically taken out of the NFL along with the other African-American players. Uh, he was the player coach. Uh, and he earned a place in pro football history as just one of two African Americans in the new league. 1921, he earned another distinction. He was the first African American head coach in NFL history when the pros named him co coach of the team. This is what Pollard said about his experience. It was evident in my first year at Akron back in 1919 that they didn't want blacks in there getting that money. And here I was, playing and coaching and pulling down the highest salary in pro football. Yeah, the Packers, there we go. Well, uh, Curly Lambeau, uh, he wasn't above board on everything he did. Uh, in 1922, Green Bay withdrew from the uh, APFA after admitting the use of players who had college eligibility remaining during the 1921 season. Promising to obey rules, Curly Lambert Lambo used $50 of his own money to buy back the franchise. He went broke. So a local merchant said, hey, we like this team here. We're going to give you $2,500 as a loan. And we're setting this thing up as a public nonprofit corporation. That's how the team is going to be operated, with a board of directors, no owners. No owners, 102 years ago. To this day, there's a chairman of the board, uh, there's a board of directors, but there is no owner to interfere with the football operations of the Green Bay Packers. Uh, Red Grange, the galloping ghost. Red Grange was one of those guys back in the 1920s, Babe Ruth, uh, Jack Dempsey, Red Grange, the four horsemen of Notre Dame, Al Jolson, Charles Lindbergh, 
Um, Jack Dempsey, like I said, uh, they were at Rudolph Valentino. They were here. They were here in the 1920s. Uh, the top of the tops. Uh, Ray Grange. Oh, uh, you know how that uh, Curly Lambeau was thrown out of the league because he used college players? Well, nobody was going to throw George Hallis out. George Hallis decided to bend the rules. Late in the 1925 season, the NFL gained national recognition when the uh, All-American uh, halfback, Harold Red Grange, before his college-owned ability was up at the University of Illinois, signed a contract with the Chicago Bears. And that, this isn't unusual. Uh, this guy, John Banker, uh, who I knew 25, um, now 30 years ago, John Banker, uh, the late John Banker, was the uh, head uh, or the main curator of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He was telling me a story about a guy named Tipton, uh, who was playing uh, in a game. He had uh, only four fingers. He, he was a setter, and he's missing one of his fingers. And George Tipton's his name. And uh, he said, he heard the story, and one guy playing in the NFL on Sunday is looking over, and he sees this guy with only four fingers snapping the ball. Hey, didn't I play against you yesterday? No, I don't play football on Saturdays. Now, one thing is, they used to have face masks, but they weren't to protect their face. They were there to protect their identity. So they could play college football on Saturday, pro football on Sunday. And the guy is like, I can't believe there are two guys who are snapping balls who are missing fingers. It's tempting. It's tempting. And he played on Sunday as well. Uh, the Grange signing clearly violated NFL rules against signing players before they had completed their college eligibility. But the signing of Red Grange and the subsequent national barnstorming tour of the Bears uh, took may have saved the NFL in the 1920s. Any New York Giants fans here? How many Giants fans are here? Well, condolences on the season, first of all. <laughs> There's always next year. And God, you've won how many Super Bowls? Parcells uh, won, you know, and uh, well, Parcells won two. Yeah, he won two, right? And uh, Coughlin won two. You know, four isn't bad uh, at all. So if you have a bad season this year, the year before, Joe Judge, and I'm not going to bring everybody up. But anyway, the New York Giants should retire the number 77. Red Grange wore 77, right? Here's the story. You don't know the story of Red Grange and the New York Giants? I don't. You don't? Okay. Red Grange goes on this tour. Crowd 36,000 on Thanksgiving uh, Day. Watch Grange and the Bears play the Chicago Cardinals at Wrigley Field. At the beginning of December, the Bears won on an eight-game, 12-day barnstorming tour. St. Louis, Philadelphia, the Polo Grounds, Washington, Boston, Pittsburgh, Detroit, then back to Chicago. And there is the Galloping Ghost. And without the Galloping Ghost, there will be no New York Giants football franchise. <laughs> Late that season, 73,000 people crowded into the Polo Grounds to watch the Bears play the Giants. The Giants were owned by Tim Marin. Now, the New York media makes the Mara family out to be some saintly individuals. They weren't. They weren't at all. And I should know, I dealt with them. Uh, Tim Mara was a bootlegger, and he was a bookie, and he got the $500 to buy the franchise because he was a bootlegger and he was a bookie. Uh, so the Giants, if you, in fact, if you go through some of the ownership of the old days, Hallis was was friends with, with mobsters. Mike Dick had told me that. that especially his brother Muggsy, Muggsy Hallis. He said there were mobsters all over the place when he broke in in 1961. And he heard all the stories as well. Uh, Art Rooney in Pittsburgh, well, he became the owner of the Steelers because of a big day at Aqueduct, and he put his money down. Uh, there were a lot of these guys in the early days of the NFL. Uh, so, Mary, his franchise is going nowhere and he's losing money, absolutely losing money. But Red Grange comes in, 
73,000. He gets a good deal of cash that day, and that keeps the New York Giants solvent into 1926, and then they were able to solidify themselves. Uh, the Bears went out to uh, Los Angeles to defeat the Los Angeles Tigers. 75,000 people saw them at the Memorial Coliseum. Now, uh, in Pottsville, Pennsylvania, they're still claiming they won the 1925 championship. Pottsville uh, Maroons, the legendary uh, team, played as a member of the National Football League here in 1925 to 1928. In 1925, the Maroons compiled a record wildly viewed as the league's best. They climaxed their season by defeating Notre Dame uh, in a well-publicized pro versus college match in Philadelphia. But then they were denied the NFL championship in the controversial league decision. Despite strong regional support, the franchise moved to Boston in 1929, just in time for the stock market crash. So here we go, December 6, 1925. And uh, Pottsville defeats the Chicago Cardinals. The Maroons had a 9-2 record. Cardinals 9-1-1, one, one, heading into the showdown. Now, there was no such thing as an official NFL champion back in those days. You played out your schedule, that was it. No champion. Despite finishing the 1925 season with the league's best record, Pottsville was not awarded a league title. Here's why. After beating Chicago, Pottsville was eager to cash in on an exhibition game against the former Notre Dame College Stars. The game was played at Chad Park in Philadelphia. But the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets said, hey, wait a minute. That's our territory. They cannot come into our territory. We're playing a game that day. They're going to take fans away from us. They can't do it. Can't be done. Well, the NFL president, Joseph Carr, agreed with Frankfurt uh, prior to the Puttsville Notre Dame match. Carr warned the Maroons three times not to play that game. And he meant business. He fined them $500, suspended the team's right to the championship, revoked the Pottsville NFL franchise. But Chris O'Brien, he was the Chicago Cardinals owner, and he said he would only accept the title if it was clearly won on the field to play. The NFL recognizes Chicago as the 1925 champions, the Chicago Cardinals. Red Grange and AFL won the uh, first American Football League. There were four American Football Leagues. Why was there a first American Football League? Well, hey, thanks, Red. Thanks for saving teams, but uh, you can't have a team in New York because we're going to make sure Tim Merrick is okay. Yeah, it's great that you want a team, but he ain't getting one. So he and his agent, C.C. Pyle, Cash and Terry Pyle, say, okay, you know what? We'll start our own league, L.A. Wildcats, uh, the New York Yankees. Pyle subsequently announced the formation of the American Football League as a showcase for his client. The Los Angeles Wildcats never played the game in Los Angeles. They were a road team. The first NFL Los Angeles team was the Los Angeles Buccaneers. This, too, a road team based in Chicago. A lot of Californians on that team primarily University of California and University of Southern California alumni. There was one guy who wasn't on that team, a guy by the name of uh, Marion Morrison. You know who he is? John Wayne. He got kicked off the USC football team and then stumbled, okay, Pilgrim, I'm here to be a stunt actor. Yeah, John Wayne. He was part of that. He could have played there, but he ran afoul of his coach after getting injured. The Buccaneers did play two true home games in Los Angeles, both of them exhibitions against Red Grange in January 1927. The Buccaneers also played two games in San Francisco, including the last game of the Buccaneers' existence, an exhibition game against the Los Angeles Wildcats. Grange would tear up his knee. Well, that was his problem and he was no longer effective the way he was. Football salaries in those days, uh, maybe 75, maybe 100 bucks per game. About 20 years ago, I met a guy, he was in his 90s, he was tall, stood straight. He said he played for Staten Island, the Staten Island Staple Lids. He got $5 a game. 
The average ticket price was less than a buck. Uh, the team roster consisted of 15 players. Revenues were initially generated solely through paid attendance and related concessions. The standard game contract provided for a guarantee to the visiting team about $1,000 against the visitors cut of 40% of gate receipts after deducting 15% for rental and maintenance of the field. Well, what's the most heated rivalry in the NFL? Tell me. Anybody playing the New York Giants in the NFC East, right? <laughs> Anybody playing Washington in the NFC East? Anybody playing Dallas in the NFC East? Anybody playing Philadelphia in the AFC East, correct? Giant fans, who's your most hated rival right now? In Philly. Not Dallas? Who said Dallas? Washington's so bad that you don't consider them a rival right now. Or well, back in the day of Joe Gibbs and Bill Parcells, right? JJ, uh, Jimmy Johnson. Well, anyway, these guys actually needed one another. Curly Lambeau and George Hallis. Believe it or not, the Chicago Bears were about bankrupt and nearly went out of business. By 1931, the NFL decreased to 10 teams and only eight teams, the lowest in NFL history, in 1932. And Green Bay's Curly Lambeau saved the Chicago Bears with a $1,500 loan so George Hallis could meet the payroll. The IOU is in the Green Bay Packers Hall of Fame. Curly Lambeau saved, saved the Chicago Bears. Can you imagine, you know, Green Bay saving the Chicago Bears? Green Bay has, what, 30,000 people? But that's what happened. And Hallis would repay the Bears later on, uh, rather than the Packers. Uh, the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets, the 1926 champions, uh, they joined the NFL in 1924, but they couldn't play games on Sunday because of blue laws. They played games on Saturdays. This is how semi-professional the NFL was. The Yellow Jackets won the 1926 championship game. Before the start of the 1931 season, Frankfurt Stadium was severely damaged by fire, forcing the club to find another location uh, for its games. The team played at the Municipal Stadium, the 100,000-seat stadium, and Baker Bowl. Uh, they wanted to get Philadelphia to support the team. They didn't. They folded. But in 1933, the Philadelphia Eagles entered the NFL. Uh, you got to be a football hero, especially in the 1930s. Uh, early Hollywood movies were based on the college game. Horse Feathers with the Marx Brothers, one of my favorite movies. Swordfish still holds up. Written in 1932 at Lampoon College Sports, Quincy Adams Wagstaff. The new president of Huxley accidentally hires two speakeasy characters, Baravelli and Pinky, to help his school win the big football game against the rival Darwin University. Mickey Mouse, Papa, were subjects in two football cartoons. And there was a song, You Gotta Be a Football Hero to Get All the Beautiful Girls, written by Al Sherman, not Alan Sherman, who did the parodies, Buddy Fields and Al Lewis, not Grandpa, or uh, Schnauzer from Part 54, Where Are You? Uh, you got to be a football hero. Look at these guys. They were football heroes, right? Uh, oh, Mickey. Mickey scored the touchdown. And, of course, fighting over the affections of olive oil. Olive oil. I'd rather have Betty Boop, but that's me. Uh, this guy, G.A. Richards. Um, I'll just put, put out the positive on him. Uh, the negative on him, he owned two radio stations, uh, WJR in Detroit, WGAR in uh, Cleveland, and he was responsible for the anti-Semitic Father Coughlin being on the air. FCC tried to yank his license because he was promoting hate on the radio with Father Coughlin. Father Coughlin was off the air by 1940, because the church got him off the air. For the NFL, he's the guy who got media money. Uh, in 1934, WJR's owner, G.A. Dick Richards, 
purchased the Portsmouth Spartans from Ohio, moved them to Detroit, named them the Lions. Richard con Richards convinced the NFL to allow the Lions and the defending world champion, Chicago Bears, to play for the Western Division Championship on Thanksgiving. He also convinced NBC that they should broadcast the game all across the U.S. on radio. The game ended up becoming a huge success, uh, being played at the University of Detroit Stadium in front of a sold-out crowd of 26,000 fans. But more importantly, 94 radio stations picked up the game. That would eventually lead to money for the NFL from radio. Uh, and also, it would start, sort of start the tradition that Detroit hosts the Thanksgiving games, but they did not initially host a lot of Thanksgiving games uh, after this. Uh, 1934, the NFL discovers media as a, re a renovate generator. Within five years, the NFL's on TV. Second incarnation of the American Football League, AFL 2, becomes a rival to the NFL, 1936. At the time, the NFL had nine teams and played in many of the largest population centers. The AFL competed directly with the NFL in many of the same cities, except one, Cleveland. The AFL folds, the NFL takes in the Cleveland Rams. Quite the history. Cleveland, Los Angeles, Anaheim, St. Louis, Los Angeles. They've been in five different spots. Um, oh, this guy should be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Anybody ever hear of Charles McNeil? He was a math teacher. Taught JFK, John F. Kennedy at Riverdale High School. Uh, he was a compulsive gambler, and uh, he should be in all sports hall of fame, particularly now with FanDuel and everything else. In the 1930s, Charles K. McNeil may have invented the point spread, which made the outcome of football games more interesting than just the final score. It's not known if he actually came up with the idea or borrowed it, but he refined it, and it opened up a new, albeit illegal, now it's legal, industry. People bet on scores, not which team won. How many of you uh, put a couple bucks in games here and there? Nobody? Oh, okay. One guy admits it. One guy, right? How many are not admitting it? <laughs> anyway, so you bet the point spread over another, all that stuff? Well, the point spread is this guy, McNeil, and he made football interesting. World War II comes about, one of the great names of all time, the Steagles, uh, with Philadelphia and Pittsburgh combining. Teams survived by recruiting retired players or using college players. Teams located near Army and Navy bases could use players stationed near their cities, like Philadelphia, like New York, West Point, and others. But Pittsburgh's a problem, no nearby military bases. 1943, Art Rooney merged his team with Philadelphia to get players who were stationed at nearby military bases. 1944, he merged his team with the Chicago Cardinals for the same reason. And uh, he was thinking about doing it with the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1945 if the war did not end. Uh, the All-American Football Conference and the color barrier. The NFL put up a color barrier around 1934. That's Marion Motley. Cleveland Browns, All-American Football Conference. The NFL, post-World War II, mom and pop operation, competition from the new All-American Football Conference. Black or Negro players returned to NFL rosters in 1946 for the first time in 13 years. But there would be a quota on Negro players taking roster spots. First getting a Negro player, that was a problem. Uh, the other owners, like George Preston Marshall, who would tell you he was a racist, uh, he didn't like that, didn't like it at all. Uh, and then the quota would be four per team. Uh, the NFL came to uh, Los Angeles in 1946. Uh, that's the movie Spartacus. There's Kirk Douglas. That was good. That was Dalton Trumbo writing uh, for the first time after being blacklisted. Uh, with his name. Well, Woody Strode was in that movie. Woody Strode uh, was uh, one of the first of the returning African Americans into the National Football League along with Kenny Washington in 1946.
Daniel Reeves moves the Cleveland Rams to L.A. in 1946 under the condition that he hires Negro players as part of the lease agreement with the L.A. Coliseum. In another talk I do, I go into, I do a talk in 1946 into about a seven minute, uh, about seven minute picking it apart. It was a guy named Harding who was a uh, writer for a black newspaper in Los Angeles who said, hey look, he can come, but uh, the taxes are paid by Latinos and uh, African Americans and whites. And uh, it was built with state and federal money. How could you say no? Harding actually got the ball down to the five-yard line. San Francisco 49ers start playing the All-American Football Conference in 1946. They join the NFL in 1950. Breaking the color barrier, that is Kenny Washington, who uh, was considered the best running back in the 1930s in college, so much so that George Hallis wanted him on his team. He was a great player. Uh, Daniel Reeves had to agree uh, to hire Negroes. There was uh, opposition from other owners, and he hires Kenny Washington and Woody Strode. Uh, the AAFC, no color barrier. I remember uh, interviewing uh, Paul Brown about uh, Bill Willis and Marion Motley. And Paul Brown said, I didn't care. They could have been chartreuse. If they could play football, they're playing football for me. But he took care of uh, his two players because they were death threats against them. Bill Willis and Marion Motley were hired by Brown, and uh, they became teammates and long life friends. Now, you know the story about Jackie Robinson and all the stuff he had to endure. Well, these guys did it before Jackie Robinson, 1946. They endured taunts, racial slurs, dirty plays from opponents on the field. One game, Paul Brown kept them in Cleveland, game in Miami, 1946, because the two received death threats. Their teammates welcomed them. It was a semi-pro operation. That's Stan Jones. Uh, he was a member of the Chicago Bears and ended up being a uh, coach in the NFL. And we were talking one day, and I'll tell you about uh, uh, him in a second. The NFL has 13 teams in 1950. They take in some All-American football conference teams. The NFL was a semi-pro league. Sam, Stan Jones, an offensive lineman with the Chicago Bears, said, we'd finish the season in December and look for another job. This is his quote. We were in the football. We weren't a full-time operation. A lot of people don't realize that. Football teams closed up after the last game of the year, packed everything away. George Hallis wasn't a football, full-time football man himself. Most of the players were not even paid during the eight weeks of training camp in the 1950s. Anybody here remember Andy Robeselli? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're old. We're, <laughs> here, we're old. Yeah. He, had, uh, he was uh, with the Los Angeles Rams. And uh, he went to Daniel Reeves and said, listen, I cannot stay here. I got two businesses in Stanford, Connecticut, the sporting goods store and the travel agency. I need to be home. I need that. And Daniel Reeves traded him to the New York Giants and, you know, he was part of the defense, defense. Uh, so anyway, uh, most players uh, weren't paid during the eight weeks of training camp in the 1950s. In fact, the players didn't even have their own equipment except for shoes. The team uh, shared all the equipment. Uh, the shoes were interesting. If a player got cut, the players would buy the shoes from the guy for a buck and sell it for two bucks for the guys coming in with the profits going to beer. Beer. Burt Bell, the Eagle, Eagles founder, NFL commissioner. A lot of people, this is Frank Trapuca, a lot of people think even in those days that the National Football League was the almighty league, but it wasn't, uh, said Frank Trapuca, who lived in Montclair. The National Football League in those days was haphazard. He was not impressed with the NFL, not impressed at all. Uh, I was totally disenchanted with football, so I came back here to Bloomfield, New Jersey, and called quits, and I get a call from Sas Saskatchewan, and the fellow says, what would it take uh, you to come up here and play? I'm making a big $12,000 at the time, so I hurriedly said $25,000. He says, you got it. That was the year the Canadian Football League opened up uh, roster spots to eight Americans. Prior, they only had three. 
There's a competition for players between the NFL and the Canadian Football League. Suddenly, that disappeared in 1956. I wonder why. Uh, Hallis was running the NFL in the 1950s. Again, Tripucal. He was the founder, and he pretty much ran the league. Uh, many times, we used to kid on the field, on the sideline, that the referee would reach into his pocket and look over to George Hallis uh, to see if Hallis, uh, to look over to George Hallis, if Hallis didn't give him any sign, he'd throw the flag. If Hallis shook his head no, he wouldn't throw the flag. Green Bay needs a stadium. Green Bay needs a stadium. The NFL said, hey, listen, we, you can't play on the stadium anymore. It's just, we need a better stadium. They built a new stadium in Milwaukee. Go to Milwaukee full time. You know, they got the brand new county stadium. It's there for the Braves. You're playing games there anyway. Why don't we just take all your games there? Well, the Green Bay, uh, rather, the Chicago Bears owner and coach George Hallis used to travel up to small Wisconsin towns in the offseason to help raise money so the Green Bay Packers had enough funds to play from year to year. Those fundraisers took place in the 1950s. By the 1950s, the stadium, the Green Bay Stadium, was seen as too small and inadequate, even after they expanded the place. The leaders of the NFL, including George Hallis, gave the Packers board an ultimatum. Build a new stadium, play in Milwaukee full time. Milwaukee had that stadium in 1953, and uh, Green Bay played two or three of its annual six home games there. It would do so until 1994. The residents of Green Bay responded by approving a bond issue in April 1956 to build a new city stadium, uh, which opened the following year. The old city stadium became a high school football field. Uh, TV. How many of you are glued to the TVs on Sunday? <laughs> Glo uh, who, who's glued? You're glued to the TV? Oh, no, I'm talking about the sign. Oh, the sign. Admiral. Do you have an Admiral TV? Yes, back, yeah. And do you like it? I like it. As much as you play with the antennas. <laughs> Not only did you have to play with the I give it an early days of TV speech. Not only that, you know, when I have young people, I say, you know, we had a tough time watching TV, didn't we? You, you, know, you put on the TV, and you had to wait about a minute for the picture tube to warm up. Yeah. So you used to sit down, <laughs> wait, and then you get on, and there'd be rolling, <laughs> right? And not only that, it had snow. <laughs> so what do you what do you fix first? The rolling, vertical hole. But the snow, it's a little bigger problem because you got to grab the rabbit ears, right? Sometimes you end up like this. Oh. <laughs> Somebody is in the room with you. Don't move. Toby Gillis is good. Don't move. I can't stand that way. <laughs> then when the rabbit ears broke, what'd you do? You got a coat hanger, right? Yeah. Right? And then the tuner would break. Or foil. Or foil, right. Then the tuner would break. And what would happen with, when the tuner broke? You had to get them on those pliers. Long those pliers to turn it. So we had a tough time watching TV. I remember the pliers. That's all you have to do. You can be in the back of the room. All you have to do is, uh, uh, uh. Boy, did we have a tough time. We had a tough time. Everybody in here agree that we had a tough time watching TV. Anyway, the NFL had a tough time with TV. Admiral World Championship Pro Football Game on television and radio, the Rams and Browns. This is 1950. Uh, the Los Angeles Rams, Dan Reeves, uh, the owner, entered the deal with Admiral. And Admiral would pay him X amount of dollars. And they wanted to sell TVs. So he would show the home games on TV. Admiral would sell the TVs. Uh, 1949, 300,000 people showed up at the Coliseum to watch the six home games, 50,000. In 1950, uh, the games were televised, the home games in LA. Attendance dropped by 50%. Burke Bell suggested, hey, don't show your home games. Don't give it away for nothing. It became a blackout rule. It's been challenged many times. Uh, the original judge, Ellen Grimm in Philadelphia, said, no, it's OK, they can do it. The blackout rule still debated in Washington. Remember the Giants-Patriots game? the year that uh, the Patriots 
were going undefeated, and like everybody except Baghdad Bob was broadcasting that game because the Senate said, we'll take away your antitrust exemption in the 1961 Sports Broadcast Act. And they haven't done anything since then. Dumont, you're too young to remember Dumont. You have to, to remember Dumont, you have to be 73 to 74 years old <laughs> to remember that. Anyway, maybe I need Cosell to come here. Hey, Road Orange, get over here. Road, tell me about Dumont TV because you ended up hiring me as the number one employee for Monday Night Football 1970 because you wanted a personality. Rune Arlich was the head of ABC Sports, you know, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Um, and he uh, came up with uh, Wide World of Sports and all. December 23rd, 1951, Dumont televised the first ever coast-to-coast -coast professional football game, the Browns and the Rams. Dumont, I don't know where they scraped this together, but they somehow scraped together $75,000 for the rights of the game. Uh, 1952, Dumont aired only New York Giants games before moving to a national scope the following season. 1953-54, Dumont broadcast Saturday night games. Saturday night football. First time the NFL games were televised coast to coast in prime time for the entire season. Dumont also did the Thanksgiving game in 1953 between Green Bay and Detroit. By 1955, Dumont was crumbling. Their last show was uh, on September 23rd, 1955, it's a game show. Uh, NBC replaced Dumont as the network for NFL championship game. They paid $100,000. ABC acquired the rights to the Thanksgiving game. National Football League was in the right place at the right time. There's no better TV game than football. A viewer could see everything as it develops on the field, the line of scrimmage, the quarterback handing off, passing the ball, the receiver catching it. Easy game to watch. And it didn't hurt that the New York Giants won the World's Championship in 1956 and played in the greatest game of all time, 1955. Although if you talk to Artie Donovan, he said it was a lousy game. We should have killed them. We should not have been in overtime beating them. Uh, between the Giants and Johnny Unitas and the Baltimore Colts, after all, the Giants had Hanson Frank Gifford, right? Hanson Frank Gifford, defense, defense, defense. And Dick Nolan, the defensive back. Well, his mug was on uh, the Camel cigarette uh, ad in Times Square. The Giants were box office, Madison Avenue. Uh, the game started the a love affair between Americans and football. Greatest game ever played, Alan Amici uh, going into the end zone against the Giants to give the uh, Colts the championship. Uh, December 28, 1958, uh, Johnny Unitas drives his team downfield in overtime and Amici plows into the end zone. The game caught the attention of the American public and after watching the game, Lamar Hunt decided, if I can't get a team for Dallas in the NFL, I'll form a rival circuit, the fourth American Football League. Sam Huff, I love Sam Huff. I knew Sam Huff. Uh, we were in uh, Palm, uh, yeah, we were in Palm Springs one year, Marriott Hotel, and uh, the Pro Football Hall of Fame had a traveling exhibit, and it was one of his helmets, and it uh, looked like it was rear-ended by somebody. It was rear-ended by Jimmy Brown, head to head, uh, and uh, you know, I said to Huff, I said. What happened? He said he hit me in the head, my helmet crumbled, I crumbled, they gave me smelling salts, I was back on the field. Really good guy, Sam Huff, really good guy. We had up the score against the Giants in 1966 because he wanted to stick it to Alex Sherman. But the uh, best thing that happened to him was traded to Washington because he became a vice president of the Marriott Hotel. Uh, CBS did a uh, documentary entitled The Violent World of Sam Huff. He was the Giants' middle linebacker. He was profiled in Mike during a preseason game to give viewers an inside look at the NFL game. That was done in Montreal against Pittsburgh. And Sam said that there were a lot of guys who were taking cheap shots at him because they wanted to be on TV. Uh, oh, there is me. That's Pete Rozelle, commissioner of the NFL. That was during the USFL-NFL trial. Uh, 
Pete taught me a lot, actually, about the NFL, the jolt. Uh, CBS paid the owners of the Chicago Cardinals $500,000 to move the team from uh, Chicago to St. Louis. Uh, supposedly, the Cardinals' ownership uh, was supposed to move the temporary seating they had in Comiskey Park to Bush Stadium in St. Louis. It wasn't that at all. Uh, it was CBS local affiliate can run the full slate of Chicago Bear Road games, which were blacked out because uh, the Cardinals were playing at home on Sunday afternoon, so they got rid of that problem. Neither the Bears nor Cardinals were seen much on local Chicago TV because of the blackout rule. And the only time Chicago uh, games were on TV was when the Bears and Cardinals were on the road together. The Cardinals franchise played only four games a year in Chicago. During the team's final seasons, they farmed games out to Minneapolis and Buffalo so Chicago could watch games. Uh, there he is, the handsome Frank Gifford. Uh, what, what did I just hear? Look at Gifford. Oh, look at Gifford. He's handsome, huh? <laughs> I once gave a talk at, up in Fairfield, Connecticut, and the Giants, <laughs> that's senior residence, Giants used to, uh, their training camp was at Fairfield University. And this woman who was 60 years ago, this woman was probably about 75, and she says to me, oh, that Frank Gifford, he was such a bad, bad boy. I said, do you want to tell me more? Oh, I could tell you a lot. How old were you? I was 20. <laughs> uh, Frank Gifford, they played Pittsburgh. Jar the Giants, the Darlings of Madison Avenue, led by Frank Gifford, the uh, uh, CBS show with Sam Huff, the 20th Century, hosted by Walter Cronkite, also caught the yes. football bug. Okay. Swinging 1960s, football changes totally, 58 to 66. Branch Rickey, Continental Baseball League, actually impacts the NFL. AFL starts, television, Congress and President Kennedy's impact on the NFL, the bidding war, and then the merger, and the formation of the New Orleans Saints. John Kennedy, uh, who was assassinated on November 22, 1963, left one permanent impression on the sports world. He created the massive stream, revenue stream, for sports owners from television, signing the Sports Broadcast Act of 1961. He wasn't responsible for it. The Brooklyn Congressman Emanuel Seller wrote the book. Rather, the bill gets no credit these days for changing the landscape. Uh, the Seller bill allowed the National Football League to market its broadcast rights as a league package, evenly spreading broadcasting revenues among the franchises, guaranteeing each team substantial annual revenues. There is Emanuel Seller, who I think was elected to, call it, uh, to uh, Congress during the uh, War of 1812. The act would also apply to the National Basketball Association, National Hockey League, other sports. Major League Baseball didn't need it because it had an antitrust exemption, which allowed uh, the American and National Leagues to sell the product, baseball, as one to TV networks. Pete Gogolak was the game changer. You're smiling. You like Pete? He's good. He's good. He's good. He's good in Buffalo, too. Uh, he's the game changer. That's Daryl LaMonica, by the way, holding, who went on to a great career at Oakland. Yeah. The NFL the Giants called, explains Gogolak, I signed with the Giants, made three times as much as I made with the Bills. He wasn't even a football player, he was a kicker. Uh, I signed for $35,000. They gave me a four-year no-cut contract. I went to the Giants, the team wasn't as good as the Bills. Then you know what happened. The AFL started calling NFL players, and the war started, and basically a few months later, the two leagues merged. So maybe I started something. I not only started the soccer-style kick, but, I may, but maybe I started the merger. There's Pete Alvin, right, Pete Rosell. Uh, Joe Namath makes the Super Bowl important. Uh, Super Bowl one and two, they weren't even called the Super Bowl in those days. So you, American Football League, National Football League, World Championship game. Joe Namath and the Jets, they beat Baltimore. The validation of the careers of AFL players and the AFL. There I am talking to Joe, 1988, about the accomplishments 20, year, uh, 20 years prior. The uh, Jets-Colts game is a turning point. Joe guarantees the Jets will win and delivers. 
More importantly, because the name it and the new name change, the Super Bowl, Super Bowl break, the Super Bowl takes on a new life. There was a flimsy pregame show featuring a marching band, the Apollo 8 astronauts, Frank Borman, William Anders, and Jim Lovell, who had circled the moon two weeks earlier, led the crowd in the Pledge of Allegiance. The anthem was performed by a trumpet player by the name of Lloyd Geisler. The Florida A&M University marching band performed the halftime show. Nobody rated the commercials. How many of you watched the game just for the commercials? <laughs> Any good commercials that you remember? Joe Green, Coke. Uh, and there's the program for the Super Bowl. The Jets' victory is arguably the most important win in the NFL history. Put the AFL on par with the established league. The NFL became a hot property. The Super Bowl would go on to be a quasi-national holiday. Might as well be a national holiday. And it is the most watched TV event of the year. And there is Joe going into uh, the tunnel. The Jets win. Monday Night Football with how it goes. So, Dan, Don, Maryland, and Keith Jackson. I once asked Keith, I said, uh, did you ever regret losing that gig? He said, no, it added about 20 years to my life. Mm -hmm. These two guys were hard partiers. Everybody was a hard partier. Uh, and Gifford will come in the next year. Uh, 1970s, it's a business. Television contracts give teams more money. The World Football League challenge leads to the Seattle and Tampa expansion. The Players Association and the NFL owners wars. Uh, football pains, the USFL uh, suing the NFL. There's me interviewing uh, one of the first uh, attorneys Donald Trump ever hired that went to jail. Uh, Harvey Meyerson for bilking his clients, uh, along with Dan Cooper. Uh, Roy Cohn was supposed to be the USFL attorney, but he got AIDS, and so they hired Harvey. Uh, but they were in the courtrooms. Uh, 1982, the players go on strike. USFL started in 83. USFL, NFL antitrust case occurs in 1986. 1987, the NFL players go on strike, yet the game is exploding in popularity. TV enriches owners and players, Rupert Murdoch. Uh, 1993, um, gambling, get the NFL. We only have the Simpsons. We have Gary Shandling. We have Tracy Ullman. It's not enough. We need something. And they got the NFL and basically solidified Fox. The NFL becomes a political force in Arizona over the Reverend Dr. Mark Luther King Jr. Day. Make it a state holiday and get a Super Bowl. They did. MLK Day becomes official in Arizona in 1992. And there's franchise movement. LA Rams to St. Louis, the Raiders to Oakland, Cleveland to Baltimore, Houston to Nashville, and brain injuries, which have been buried in Colin Kaepernick. Uh, 21st century, it's a well-oiled machine. It's a money machine. Concept, concussions are a problem, except nobody's talking about it anymore. The NFL and Colin Kaepernick caused a cultural divide. TV and streaming services want the product, like Amazon. Men between 18 and 54 watch the product, and advertisers can reach that audience. Billions of TV and streaming money go into the owner's pockets. Well. This is where the NFL and pro football is today, and uh, that's Big Ben Davidson, and that's Phil Filippiano, and that's me, Tom's River. We had a big party that night. I survived Sandra Fortunato, some of whom, uh, some of you might remember her from CBS telecasts of Giants games in the 1960s, where the camera somehow always ended up on Sandra. Always. She's a very nice woman, by the way, extremely nice and uh, self-proclaimed Miss Super Bowl, complete with a crowd. Anyway, uh, thank you so much. Any questions, any comments, uh, it's all your turn to talk. This is a complete